I'm Alyssa Palai, and it's my pleasure today to welcome you to the Playbook webinar, Making Economically Driven Project Decisions Using a Project Economic Model. Our speakers today are myself. I'm the VP of Marketing at Playbook. Eric Graves, our VP of Product Development, will be leading the discussion. David Paulson, our CEO, is here to support in the Q&A. In terms of agenda, we'll briefly talk about Playbook the company and the problem we're solving. We'll talk about the scope of the project model we're going to show you, review the project economic model. We'll talk about best practices for implementing a project economic model. Then David will lead us through the Q&A. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. Um, you can type your questions into the questions box and we will be monitoring them. Um, don't worry if we can't get through all of the questions because we can answer them via email and we'll also be sending you a link to the webinar after the webinar is over to share as you see fit. And with that, I will hand it off to Eric. Thanks, Alyssa. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, so just quickly before we jump right in and uh, the problem we're solving, I just want to mention real quickly that uh, in case you're not familiar, we're a Cure Playbook, the makers of Playbook software. We've been uh, consulting on lean product development for many, many years now, and a key, key piece of that has been developing these economic models and helping companies uh, get a handle on some things like we'll discuss here. So that's the short version. Let's get on to the problems and the solutions. So you know, we're developing a new product. We're you know, obviously faced with a lot of questions at the beginning throughout the project. Some of them we've listed here, but there's a, a lot more. You know, in most cases, we have multiple questions. There's a trade-off against delay and feature, reducing the cost and delay, changing the plan. There's multiple questions we have to answer. Um, and uh, ultimately, if we don't have good ways to answer those, we have a lot of issues. Um, right now, you know, the way we answer them today in most cases is conversations, emails, meetings, hallway conversations, oftentimes there's a lot of disagreements involved, uh, some pounding on the table sometimes, and in general, you know, a lot of disagreements. And a lot of that is because, you know, we don't necessarily all share the same view of how important it is to add a feature or how valuable it would be to get done a month earlier or how much it would cost to get done a month later. Uh, Don Reinertsen, for those of you familiar, is one of the uh, our favorite authors and uh, lean gurus. He's the guy who introduced us this very powerful solution. He you know, very often asks his clients during one of his workshops, you know, how much it would cost the company if a product's going to be launched, would be a launch a month late. There's very often a 100 to 1 variance. You know, one person will say $10,000, someone else will say a million dollars. Big discrepancy in opinions on how important it is to be on time or, or accelerate the project. You know, 50 to 1 kind of variance, you know, $20,000 to $1 million kind of variance is kind of an average, he says, based on the data he's gotten. And we haven't collected the data, but we can corroborate. There's a lot of difference of opinion out there in terms of what the right thing to do is, because there's a lot of difference of opinion in terms of you know, what the costs of not doing it are. So you know, without any sort of objective analysis to assist us in making these trade-off decisions, you know, we often defer to the the will of the person with the highest position or the one who pounds his fist on the table at us. You know, and this is many hours in meetings and hallway conversations and we're often less frustrated that the wrong decision is made. We end up changing our minds later and creating rework, rework you know, and delays in the process or even worse, you know, no decisions made at all and the clock is ticking and you know, someone's going to be left to work long hours later to make up for those indecision delays. Essentially, it all adds up to frustration and lost profits, which just tends to make the problems even worse. You know, when we are making good money, stress level goes up, people's opinions tend to get even more divided, and we tend to rush to judgment you know, or fear and delay our decisions even more. So you know, this is, is a vicious circle. We can get ourselves out of that vicious circle uh, with a simple little model. So. Um, you know, there's a simple, powerful economic you know, analysis tool called a project economic model. We're going to be looking at the very basics of a project economic model today. Um, in this, we'll be looking at trade-offs on a single project, you know, trading off a delay against adding a feature or reducing the cost. 
things like that. You'll see as we go through the examples. Um, the model that I'll show, we won't actually do this, but the model I'll show is a case where we have a family of products, different flavors of the product, like you may have a high-end version, a low-cost version. Um, it also covers cases where you have different uh, sales volumes and distribution models. And maybe the, the ones you're selling overseas are going through a distributor. There's a different uh, pricing model for those. This type of a model covers that too. Um, there are some things that we're not going to get into in terms of the complexities and, and other places you can go next once you have this under, under your belt. That is trade-offs across projects and you know, which cross projects to prioritize. And you know, certainly there are some complexities in these projects oftentimes that we're not really going to get into, such as you know, what, what about in the case of where, where we're cannibalizing current product and stuff like that. So uh, we're just going to kind of enter at the the basic level and look at the nuts and bolts of our economic model and invite you to create your own or you know, talk to you about um, getting ours here toward the end of the, the seminar. Um, before we dive into the model though, I just want to set the stage just a little bit more. Um, assume you know the first point largely goes without saying. If you're watching this webinar, you probably already agree with this statement that you know a little bit of analysis along with our intuitions better than just intuition alone. Uh, but I just want to reiterate, you know, we're not saying that, you know, analysis is greater than intuition. Uh, we're saying that analysis plus intuition is better than just intuition alone. We're not saying you got to make decisions based entirely on what a model says. It's just inform information. Uh, my analogy for this, and you know, I like it, I think it's a great analogy, is, you know, when you're playing golf, and either anybody out there, golf players, you know, you're trying to decide what club to use, and to decide that, you need to judge the distance to the pin. You just eyeball it, look at it, make a gut call on how what it looks like. Or do you go take a couple seconds to look for the marker that's going to give you, you know, the marker that says you're 100 yards away and try to figure out how far away from that marker you are and where the pin is relative to the middle of the green. And, and you make your decision based on that. So, um, you know, looking at the marker is a little analysis that gives you a better feel for uh, what you don't necessarily have a better feel for just by eyeballing it or gut feeling it. So um, this is a lot like that. You know, and, this, and just like the marker, it's an approximation. The mar marker measures the distance to the center of the green. You know, it's not necessarily perfect even as a marker, and you're never in the same place. That you're rarely in the same place as the marker anyway, so it's a judgment call in terms of how far you are away from that marker. In general, it's an approximation, but it's a whole lot better than nothing. And so is our easy analysis and economic model. Um, so just a few more things. Uh, so in order to do an analysis, uh, we generally need to have a unit of measure on which to do that analysis. So what's the unit of measure that we should be you know, measuring our changes on? Well, so you know, there are several goals of product development, usually. You know, if you're at a medical device company, you know, one of your goals might be to save lives or cure people's pains. If you're in a DOD company, one of your goals might be to protect the country. Um, and all those are very important goals, hard to measure uh, and put some mathematics to how day-to-day -day decisions impact those goals. Um, so instead of those goals, we, we lean in on profit. Profit's easier to measure, it's easier to analyze and, and math, you know, do so in mathematical and logical ways. And uh, in general, it's um, if you're not making a good profit, you're not going to last very long anyway. You're not going to be able to satisfy those other goals very long anyway. So we do our analysis and, and our unit of measure is profit. Um, so. What you'll see is what we have here is a very simple spreadsheet. You know, nothing, no, none of the logic in here is very, uh, certainly not rocket science. Um, it's based on simple profit and loss calculations that most people in a company can understand. It's easy, you know, the, the, therefore the model itself is easy to understand and use. Um, one of the key pieces of this tool is that if it's not used, it can't do you any good. And in order for it to be used, what we found is it has to be kind of basic and stuff that people can understand. Um, you know, I, internal rate of return, IIR, and other such things 
um, we often hear requests for that and, and there may be some places for that and certainly this is a customizable tool. We can go anywhere you want, what, anywhere you need to with it. But we start out at the simple profit loss and that's where we're going to go over and, and stay today. So uh, just a couple more things on the solution itself before we dive into the spreadsheet. Um, traditional terms for the variables we have to weigh in product development are scope, schedule, and cost. But in order to do an economic analysis, we had to use what we call the economic variables, which are expenses, unit cost, product performance, which we convert into economic variables of sales volume and sales price, and then schedule, which also impacts sales volume and sales price. And so um, these combine uh, to give us revenue and cost and from which the, we can calculate profit. And all of these decisions are trade-offs. Trade-offs against this, you know, a little more of this, a little less of that, vice versa. What's the right thing to go do? So now we're going to be measuring incremental profit to figure out what the right thing to go do is. On the top section, and that's where the sales volume, sales price is, and the lower section is where the COGS and expenses are. And those are our economic variables. So uh, underlying all of this is the notion of risk, that some of these things, most of these things, have at least a little uncertainty, if not a lot of uncertainty. And uh, we're going to scratch the surface of that today if we have time here toward the end. Um, there's a lot. It's a deep, deep topic, so we're not really going to get very far into that today. We're going to start at the basics. So um, there's one last comment before we get into it, that this tool, one of the things this tool does is, is enable us a, a good way to calculate cost of delay on a project, um, which is just great information to help us manage both within a project and across projects, very much a golden key to solving a lot of the problems we have in product development today. Um, we're going to see how we calculate cost of delay. We're not going to see all the many different places that we can apply that great information. So um, just want to make uh, that topic clear. Okay, so let's get into it and see how it works. Uh, here you are seeing the main engine of the spreadsheet. Uh, you will probably note it, recognize, <coughs> excuse me, uh, this has a prof basic profit and loss sheet. Um, so up here in this section, we have the basic forecasts for each of these different products. Uh, how many units do we expect to sell year one, year two, year three, et cetera? Um, for what's, what's the average sales price going to be on those units? What's the expected uh, cost of goods sold? And what are the engineering and development costs? And so um, you'll notice a couple of things. One, we divide it up into before product release and after product release. The years themselves are product years, not calendar years. That makes all of these calculations much, much easier and more clear, and the decisions come out the same. So that's one of the key pieces to this is to do so in product years, not calendar years, because it gets pretty messy. Um, so you'll notice here the fairly basic calculations, dollar sales, so our revenue is basically this times this, plus that times that, plus that times that. Fairly straightforward. Cost of goods sold, a similar kind of thing, is this times this, plus that times that, plus that times that. So for each of the products, what's the cost of goods sold over the course of the year? From that, we just run some simple calculations. What's our margin in dollars? What's our margin in percent? You'll notice uh, this product we're using as an example today is a fairly expensive, fairly high margin product. Um, not all products are like this, uh, and thus the, the economic models you know, tell us different things in different scenarios. But uh, this one's going to be indicative of a high margin, uh, high uh, cost product, relatively high cost product. So. Um, Beyond that, so engineering development costs, those are pulled directly from these numbers, added in here so they could be subtracted from the revenue. Marketing, so we have included in here marketing and G&A expenses as a percentage of that revenue. 
uh, we enter those values. Anywhere you see a yellow cell in here, here's the first yellow cells we've come along, are places where we enter values. And so the marketing expenses, GNA expenses, we've incorporated those in here. Um, just a quick side note, when, when these are small, like these numbers you see here, it's kind of almost negligible and it doesn't really matter much whether you add them or not. We do see some examples where they're nowhere close to small, they're 30%. Or so, in which case it's, very, it's pretty important to make sure you capture those in in terms of how it's calculating cost to delay and stuff. So, um, anyway, so there's marketing in GNA, and uh, in general, those are added up. That's our expenses. Our expenses are subtracted from our revenue, and uh, total profit. Uh, in year one, total profit in year two, total profit in year three, and then cumulative profit. We take how much we had uh, in cumulative profit the year before, from before, and add how much profit we made this year, and we attract, attack, you know, calculate cumulative profit out as far into the distance as we want to. Um, this model is built out for 12 years. We rarely go all 12 years out. We're usually forecasting five years, I would say, is probably a, a high side of the average. It's four to five years probably on average across the models we're building. Um, and so its cumulative profit over time is the in the green cells, and ultimately that's what we're targeting. We're looking at, in a baseline scenario, how much money will we have after year three or after year five or whatever you uh, select as your value horizon. Um, how far do you want to look out? We'll look at where, what is the incremental profit change upon that horizon with various trade-offs that we have to make. Um, so in this case, we're capturing three data points. We're capturing cumulative profit after one year, three years, and five years, and uh, using those to, in various trade-offs we have to make. Okay. Um, any questions so far? Are we doing okay? Yet. No questions yet. Okay. So again, if you if you have any questions as we're going through here, um, type them in your uh, questions window, and we'll we'll stop and go back. Um, you know, for the nuts and bolts ones, any sort of philosophy or uh, theory questions, but we'll we'll hold till the end. But the nuts and bolts ones, we want to capture those and address those as we go. So let us know if you have any of those. Okay. So basic P and L worksheet driven by basic forecasts. And that's the engine that we use for our calculations. Um, the scenarios page is where much of the uh, trade-offs are made, as well as um, what drives the baseline model. So you'll notice in the top of the section, these are all the numbers that were in our, our baseline scenario. Actually, I'm not sure they're the exact same ones we were looking at, but there's the baseline scenario. Um, there's a macro that runs that copies these numbers to the economic calculations page, up it pastes them into the baseline section, comes down here, copies these uh, cumulative profit values, and pastes them back into the sheet uh, from which those forecasts came. So uh, in this case, it's control E. I think I enabled my macros this morning. We'll see. Okay, so what that just did is copy these forecasts pasted them here on the economic calculations page, copied the results, and pasted them back on the scenarios page. And so in this example, uh, we have a, in, our, in this one product example, we're going to make uh, 1.2 million after the first year, we'll have about 9 million after the third year, and we'll have about 18 million after the fifth year. Um, calculating here you know, total expenses and project ROI on those. Okay. So that's all well and good. Um, so then, well, now we're ready to make a trade-off. How much more money will we have if these forecasts are different? So uh, we're going to just go ahead and do one of those examples here. I've got this example of this generic example. Uh, when you're doing a trade-off, one way to do that is to copy this example, paste it down in some other place, and start filling in the blanks. Um, this example is one where uh, we have a case where oops, copy the wrong one here. Let's try that. So my 
example I'm going to use here is we're going to use, uh, we have the option to use a more expensive material, make our product look a little better, um, therefore it's going to sell more, but probably increase COGS. And the trade-off is, is that the right thing to do? And so this upper section is where we enter how we change the baseline. It's the easiest way to um, enter how we're going to change the baseline. So delay, we're going to assume that there's no delay in this one. We'll get to that, com more com that complexity later. Uh, in this case, we're going to say we think we can bump sales by 5% by using this more expensive material. And so we've gone through and added 5% to our sales. Um, the more expensive material is going to be $20. You're going to add $20 to our unit cost. So let's go through and add $20 to the unit cost each year. And you'll notice, you know, I have them parsed out year over year because sometimes you don't have things that are constant over the life of the product. You have a cost change that's going to apply for a year or two. You'll have a, a sales bump that will only apply for a year or two but sometimes. So this allows you to have that flexibility and carry it out as far as you want but not apply it where you don't want. Um, in this case, we're also going to say that uh, there's really no development cost impact to that. that we, the expensive material is safe. There's no risk involved. We don't have to do any risk analysis, any special testing, anything special to use that other material. We just have to decide to use it. So is that a good decision to make? Should we do that? Um, surprisingly difficult to make this decision uh, in most companies, but you got this. You enter the values. You'll notice, and down here in this section, we've calculated new forecasts. Uh, we have a 5% increase in units. Uh, you'll, that's indicated by the pinkness or orangeness of this cell. Uh, orange indicates that it's different from the baseline. So that's our indicator that we've modified that value from the baseline. So 5% increase in sales there. The ASP is the same, average sales price is the same, the cost is $20 more than it was in the baseline. And here are all our updated forecasts. Everything else is the same except for volume and COGS. We can control E. And what we find is that this is our cumulative profit after five years with these forecasts and that we make about a half a million dollars more theoretically by making that decision. In, five, in, in year three and almost a million dollars by year five by making that decision. Okay. Um, so that's a basic example and that's just how easy it is to get a few answers out of this thing. Um, yes. Yeah, we had one question. I was going to insert it now. Um, okay. Someone asked, are there any tips for getting people, the stakeholders, to agree on the value of uh, the increase due to appeal uh, kinds of questions? Um, yes, I would like to defer that question um, until the Q&A session because that's a little bit of you know kind of theory question and it, it falls into the practices of how we get around to implementing this thing, building it easy, implementing it's not so easy. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about a lot of that stuff later. Um, that's all right. Uh, all right, so, so there's an example, and there's an example on the scenarios page of how we can make a trade-off. So one of the other things that we can do now with the ability to run these scenarios and calculate these values is we can calculate what we call the sensitivities. So we can look, for example, at this 1% sales loss, do the same thing, where we've already kind of pre-populated that we're going to lose. If we were to lose 1% of our sales, or 1% of our volume, excuse me, um, this is a volume calculation. Um, if, if we were to change volume by 1%, what does that mean to us in total profit after three years or after five years, whatever our value horizon is? And so it's the same thing as what we saw before. It's just the only thing we're doing is putting in the 1%. Put that in, run our macro, and what we can come out as a calculation is, uh, just make sure this is up to date, I believe it is. There we go. Yeah. So 
by the end of year three, for every percent of change there is in unit sales away from our baseline and volume, uh, will be one hundred ten hundred thousand dollars basically in in profits, and two hundred thousand dollars per percent of change in our sale, in our volumes after year five. Okay, fairly straightforward. We do the same thing with unit cost overrun. So if our unit cost were to change by 1%, what would that do for our profits? Um, if, it, if it goes over by 1%, then it turns out it costs us $160,000 after three years and $300,000 after five years. You know, if it goes under, then we make more. You know, if we come in 1% under what our target is, then we make that much more. Okay, so sensitivity unit cost. This, in this case, I have one product it gets a little messier when you have multiple products, and those products are, have different content, and changes in the cost of one aren't the same as changes in the cost of the other. Again, that's a complexity I'm not going to be able to get into today, but you know, in the simple case, you got one product, or all of the products are basically the same product, and you make a change in COGS to one, you're probably making changes to COGS in the rest of them, uh, then this works. There's a section down here for doing it per product, but I don't want to get into all, all that right now. So, uh, so then the same thing with average sales price. You can calculate you know, if we change the average sales price by 1% and the average sales price goes up in these forecasts, what does that mean to us? Uh, so number comes out you know, $250,000, $270,000 after year three, $500,000 after year five. And the same thing with development expense. You know, what if we change that by 1%? Well, uh, so in this, this, in this case, it carries over through future years. And ultimately, it, we change it by whatever 1% of the COGS is. That's how much our profit changes. And you'll notice this number is pretty small relative to the other numbers. Um, OK, so that's, that's great. Uh, that gives us these four bars in our economic sensitivities chart uh, that we can start using to make trade-offs. You know, here's how much 1% of sales means to us, converted into number of units. Here's how much 1% of COGS matters to us. Here's how much 1% of ASP matters to us. Here's how much 1% of chain expense change matters to us. So um, the one we haven't talked about yet is the delay. It's always the big one, so let's get into that next. Um, in order to calculate the impact, you know, what our sensitivity to schedule is and what the, therefore what the cost of delay is, what we like to do, what we recommend is do it the most rudimentary way possible. If, at all, if you have monthly forecasts or you can develop monthly forecasts and shift those to the right one month, that's a great rudiment, you know, and calculate, you know, over the year over year, how much your volume changed in that year based on that shift of one thing, one month to the right. It it really hold, you know, can give you a lot of great buy-in from people who don't necessarily understand how you are calculating that. So it's it's basically what I've done here. I've taken a a four-year or five-year annual forecast. I've converted it into monthly forecasts plotted it here, and essentially just shifted those monthly forecasts one month to the right, and calculate for these for this year, if I were delayed one month, what's going to be my difference in volume. So my baseline, those numbers all add up to the 900 that I had to begin with. If I shift those one month to the right, I end up with 819 instead of 900, which is a change of 9%. And it turns out, you know, yes, that's that is the same as the number that you lose in that last month. The 81 units that we didn't sell in month 12 was the 81 units that is the difference between baseline and shifted. Okay, so it's fairly straightforward, but this seems to get a lot of more buy-in than just saying that the last month drops off. Okay, because it's really it's the first month that you're not making money, and the second month that you're making less money than you would in the third month that you're making even less money than you would. And so it's it's real money that we're not making on real months 
now or very soon that we're losing and we want to make sure that we make that clear. Okay. So that's a very basic uh, just shifting the sales to calculate the cost of delay. And you'll see, you know, just doing that year over year, we use 9% the first year. We're out 1.6% the second year and 1.4% the third year. And because it flattens out, it tapers down to nothing, essentially, after that. And in general, the steeper your curve, the more a one-month shift is going to cost you. Ultimately, the, the difference between these is the area between that green line and that blue line and they calculate out the same, and the steeper that curve is, the higher your cost of delay. Okay. Um, so that's, that's one component of cost of delay. We call that the lost month cost or the shifted cost. Oftentimes, that's not all there is to cost of delay. Oftentimes, if you're late to market, you're never going to reach the peak that you otherwise would have reached had you been on time to market. If you're a month early to market, you oftentimes will exceed that peak that you would reach if you were on time. The uh, reason there being, you know, for that month that you're not out there selling your product and advertising your product for sale, some of those people that you would have sold to in a year, two years, instead are going to buy your customer, your, your competitor's product and like your competitor and stay with your competitor, even in a year, two, year, three, year, four. Um, that is sound logic. It's hard to put a number to. Uh, a lot of companies don't want to put a number to it just because uh, they don't know what the number ought to be and they'd rather just take an, a, a conservative approach and assume it's zero. Um, and it, different companies have different approaches. Some people know it's huge and they'll put in a lower than they think it is kind of number to stay conservative. Some people don't think it's very big and so they'll put in zero. And we leave it up to you to put, put what you want into. What that does essentially is, um, you know, let's say we thought it was 10% that we were going to lose. So what that does is reduce our monthly sales each 10% from where they would have otherwise been if we had only shifted. So I drop another 6.9 units if I sell 10% less. And that carries itself out over time and ends up looking something like this. At which point, you know, our cost of delays in terms of percentages of our volume end up getting much larger, you know, basically based on that value, that peak reduction. Okay, so but in this example, I'm going to let that be zero. We're going to keep it on a conservative, sort of a minimalistic approach. And we're going to have a one-month delay cost us 9% of our sales in the first year, 1.6% uh, of our sales in the second year, and 1.4% of our sales in the third year volume. So the way that works is we, we calculate that in the very rudimentary way, and then we pull that over into what we call the delay sales loss page, where into this one month column, so here's our 9%, or 1.6%, or 1.4, and then essentially zero going out. And then from that, we extrapolate up. What if it's three months? What if it's six months? What if it's 12 months worth of delay? As well as we extrapolate down and backwards. You know, what if it's only two weeks of delay? What if it's uh, we are a month early? What if we're two months early? Or what if we're six months early? That kind of thing. And we end up using these numbers in our calculations for in our in our trade-off and scenario calculations. So if I look back at my delay calculation over here on my scenarios page, if I look at the one-month delay scenario here, where I enter that my delay in this case is one month it's going to pull out of that other page the 9% loss this year, 1.6% loss that year, 1.4% loss that year, and go forward. At which point, it recalculates my volumes, and I can run my macro and see that the cost of delay of a month is $400,000 in this case, $380,000. So that's what gives us the last of these terms on the sheet we have here. Okay, um, I know I'm going pretty fast, so uh, if I'm going too fast, you know, send a little comment and say slow down, please, and I'll, I'll slow down. Um, let me quickly catch up with my notes, make sure. Uh, um, all right, so looking at this chart, now 
let's look at the same example that we ran before. Let's say I had a choice between, a, you know, I could, I could implement my more expensive material uh, to the tune of $20, $20 per unit worth of increased expense, um, but I get a 5% increase in volume out of that. Is that the right thing to go do? Is that going to be a profitable decision to go do that? Let me give you a second to think about that. Here's my 1% of sales volume sensitivity, $200,000 per percent. Here's my unit cost sensitivity. Let's say a $25 change. Let's even say a $25 change, make the calculation a little easier. You know, so $50 per unit is 1%, and that's $300,000. $25 per unit, half a percent would be $130,000. It would cost us over five years to have an extra $20 in our unit. We make five times 200K, we make a million dollars cost us 150 so we make roughly $150,000 over five years by doing that. Just by looking at these charts and pulling some numbers and making a quick look at the marker kind of calculation. Um, you know, and that jives with what comes out on the scenarios page at the bottom when I did that, you know, the long way. Roughly the same. Okay, so uh, that's getting us there. That's getting us some great info. It's given us our marker. What we can also do from there is develop what we call break-even uh, values. So, for example, for every month of delay that I might incur, how much do I need to bump sales with my new feature or whatever would you know be the cause the cause of that delay? How much do I need to bump sales to pay for that month worth of delay? Well, in this case, if I can bump sales 1% or 2% and I want to look out five years and that sales is going to be a constant over five years kind of a bump, I can delay a month before uh, that delay, before those sales aren't worth that month worth of delay. You kind of see that? Same sort of a thing, you know, how much time is it, you know, how much time would it be worth us to delay the project in order to reduce cost if it was not something we could where we could reduce cost after launch. If we had to uh, reduce cost now or in a regulated environment, we have to do all of our VNV testing on the reduced cost version of this thing. Um, you know, how much can I delay our schedule to justify taking out 1% of our, you know, $50 per unit? In this case, it's less than a month. Yeah, I can delay maybe three and a half weeks before I would have been better off going out with a more expensive product and not suffering that month's worth of delay, that three weeks worth of delay. Great info, great back pocket info to have in conversations and meetings where you're making these trade-off decisions. Okay. Um, so those are the charts. Those are the break-even values. Um, these sensitivities apply when you have decisions to make which apply for the entire uh, duration of that product, or the, at least from here until the end of your value horizon. If you're looking out five years, they're going to apply equally for all five of those years. If you don't have one of those scenarios where it's not going to apply equally to all five of those years, you use the scenarios page to, to model that. Um, in those cases where you do have the same thing going five years, you know, five years straight, the data starts at the chart, but we also have, but we have this decision calculations page that makes for easy trade-off decisions. Um, and just type it in, capture it, keep it around for later, so you don't have to have a scenario for every one of these because there are just so many of them. So here's our example again. Try less expensive. Try a more expensive. No, here's our example again. Use a more expensive material, make it look better. In this case, we just put in our 5% worth of improvement on sales. We put in a $25 unit cost change. If there's a delay, we put that here. So change to unit cost. And if you have multiple products, you may be changing the cost of those different products differently. Um, that's why that's laid out here, but we're not going to go through that example. 
changed it in NASP, put it in here, added development expense, put it in here, and out comes the value calculation here at the end. It's a little bit different if I did $20 there. So there's the $20 version of that. Okay. Real easy to pull up this sheet, run a little run a little analysis. So here's some other examples. You know, let's say I could add resources. Resources I could add will save me a month on my project. So there's a negative four here in the schedule delay. That'll save me a month on my project, but cost me $100,000. Is that worth doing? Well, the payback on that is 250K, so maybe it's worth doing. Now, you don't necessarily want to focus only on payback. You know, this 100K, that's a lot of 100K. If I'm only going to make 240K on that 100K, that's really not that great. So, of course, we calculate the ROI, you know, two and a half ROI on that. And ultimately, if my project, look back at my scenarios baseline page, my project itself as a baseline project has a five-year ROI of 9.11. Any decision that I make on that project which has an ROI of less than 9.11, is going to reduce the overall ROI on that project. And maybe that's not what I want to do. Maybe I only want to make decisions that are going to pay me back 5 to 1 or 10 to 1 or whatever I would consider that threshold to be. And, you know, kind of establishing that threshold is one of the key pieces of implementing these things and, and getting some good use out of them. So, but, uh, you know, you can kind of see numbers popping out and giving you good ideas about what to do and what not to do. A couple more examples here. So I could add a new requirement. You know, the new requirement might delay my, you know, it can, I can have trade-offs where I have to apply all of these terms. I, I could add a new requirement. It's going to increase my sales 10%. It's going to delay me a month. delay me a month. Um, it's going to increase my cost 50 bucks. Oh, right, right. No, it's, uh, that's what I was going to do. I was going to not have it delay me. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, the new requirement that I'm going to implement is going to inc increase the sales price. 100 bucks. It's going to delay me two weeks. It's also going to add $50 to my cost overall unit cost, but it's going to increase my sales price. Notice this is reduced ASP, so positives are a, lot, a reduction of sales price, negatives are an increase of sales price. So I'm going to increase sales price 100 bucks, cost myself 50 bucks more on COGS, and uh, delay two weeks. Is that the right thing to go do? Well, oh, well so by the way, $30,000 worth of expenses to implement this new requirement. Got to test it, got to buy new parts, things like that. And lo and behold, whopping 50K I'm going to make by making that change. Pretty much nothing when it comes to an ROI. And uh, not really worth doing. You, know, you don't necessarily want to go off and make wholesale changes for 50K. You want big numbers here. Those are what merit a change in the current plan. And generally speaking, because oftentimes we'll underestimate this, and we'll underestimate or overestimate you know, that. We'll be a little optimistic in these things. And kind of overriding that optimism factor is done in part by uh, not letting yourself, you know, only going for the stuff that's going to pay you back kind of big. OK. All right. So we're doing pretty well on time. Um, so we're going to go ahead and look at this example. So like we said, uh, some of these cases, uh, there's some risk involved. We, some cases, you know, in most cases, we don't really know exactly what the delay is going to be. We don't really know exactly what the sales percentage is going to be. That's not the kind of risk I'm referring to. Um, that is an important risk, and those are important things to 
uh, assess, uh, but that's beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about today. So what, what I'm talking about today in terms of risk is the probability of success. Is that this, we, have, we have an option we could go explore, and that option may not pay us back at all. It may just not work, period. And so here's, a, here's an example. We uh, have a less expensive material for one of our parts. We're going to go try to reduce cogs on this one part. Big payback if we can do it. Hundred bucks if we can if we can drop you know use this less expensive material on that. It is going to cost us a couple of weeks worth of delay to even try it because we need to go test it. Um, and if it works, then great. If it doesn't work, we still cost us that hundred bucks of delay. If it works, then we're going to save 100 bucks. If it doesn't work, we're not going to save that 100 bucks. And same sort of thing that there's 50k worth of expenses involved that we're going to spend just by trying. Is it worth trying? That's the question. So if it works, total value is going to be 300k. But there's a 50% chance that it doesn't work. And so is it still worth doing? So the way we calculate that is we, we capture in here what columns you've committed, and this changes. You know, sometimes you almost always add the development expense in these scenarios, um, but not necessarily. Uh, and sometimes you're trying to you're trying to reduce ASP, and you know you're going to add cost, and by the time you are you trying to bump ASP, and you know you're going to add cost, and by the time you find out. It's not going to work. It's too late. You've already added that cost. So there's there's some committed costs to this. We capture that here. Those are you know are not discounted by this 50%. Those are taken into account entirely. And the things that we aren't committing that we may not get if it doesn't work out are discounted by 50%. And the answer comes out not necessarily worth doing. Okay, so again, that's kind of glancing over the very deep topic of how you incorporate risk into these decisions, but it's uh, doable, and here's one of the examples in which case that can be done. Um, you'll notice if I scroll over further to the right, uh, we're calculating these break-even values for some of these decisions. So. Um, let me let me actually go back. So the the decision was or the, the question was asked, how do you get good numbers on what the impact to sales is really going to be? Um, so the answer to that is twofold. One is you don't always have to get good numbers. Um, and I'm going to start with that one. The actually getting good numbers, I'm going to defer to later, but you don't actually have to start with good numbers. And by that I mean you can calculate if I'm going to drop if I'm going to add twenty dollars to this unit cost, I can calculate how much do I need to bump sales volume in order to pay for that twenty dollars. And so that's what these break-even points are over, are over here. Just scroll over to the right and look at well if I'm going to cost myself twenty dollars, I need to bump sales by sixty by 0.6 percent in order to pay for that. And so the question can go out to whoever you want to ask it to, do you think we're going to be substantially above 0.6% with this improved look? And if everyone says absolutely positively yes, 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 you don't have to have a real number. You can make the decision to move on. So, I mean, it's really, really kind of big. And the same sort of thing on weeks is, um, you know, okay, so it's going to, you're going to bump uh, let's do this example. So you're going to add resources. It's going to cost you 100 grand to add resources. How much does that need to accelerate your project in order to pay for those resources? And not taking the ROI into account, just looking at straight up break even, you got to increase by a little over a week, and that's going to pay you back $100,000 in opportunity costs. So you know these things, you can say, well, is that going to get you more than a week or substantially more than a week is going to get you probably more than two weeks or more than three weeks. And you can start using those sort of thresholds to base your decisions on rather than real you know, input numbers in all of these cases. 
Okay. All right. So that's the basic use of our model. Um, let me just touch on one other uh, common, very, very common objective uh, objection, you know, difficulty hurdle that we run into when we're trying to implement these. And that is, I'm sure it's all swimming around in the back of your minds, these are all based on forecasts. Forecasts are always wrong. Doesn't that make this whole thing worthless? And the answer to that is no. And so there's, there's a few ways to sort of prove that and or understand that. Um, one of them is you, know, you certainly have the option to build this model in conservative ways. Instead of taking what the marketing guy says, you discount it by 50% or 30%. You know, whatever you feel like is going to make you feel better about what the numbers are, you can just do that right off the bat. Um, in a lot of cases, we like to model both the sort of mean, the average, the expected middle, and the worst case scenario, or the really conservative scenario, and map both of those. And so we have this conservatives page where, in this case, we just took what was in the, the original forecasts and we reduced sales by 30%. And we recalculate everything you know, on the page. It's all a formula based on these values that we enter up here. And so we can, we can be conservative on all of these terms, um, but I just want to point out one very important thing. The, the one term in here that is absolutely always the most uncertain is volume. And you know, I don't know if anybody would disagree with that, but it's the volume that we're most uncertain about. Does that make this whole model um, inaccurate and invalid? And so if I look at this, if I reduce volume and then recalculate all of my sensitivities, what I'll see is my cost of delay, and here's where I here's where I calculate that. I'm comparing this cost of delay to the cost of delay on my main on my other sheet, and what I find is that the cost of delay is exactly 30% less. The one month delay costs me exactly 30% less if my volumes are 30% less. Lo and behold, same thing for sales price or sales volume. If I change my volume, whatever it is, by 1%, it's 30, it matters 30% less than if I, um, you know, if, if it, it, sorry, if I, if I change volume 1%, it's worth 30% less to me if my overall volume is 30% less than what I originally predicted. Same thing with unit cost, 30% change in that sensitivity, same thing with average sales percent, percent or average sales price. 30% change in actual volume is a 30% change in that sensitivity. And so what that means is the relative size of these, and change the scale on this, um, so I might do a quick change there to make it the same as Okay, now I got the same scale going. So what, what that basically means is all of these are exactly 30% less than those. And what that means is that when I'm trading off this against this, or this against this, or this against that, all of the volume terms fall out of that equation, and the relative importance of unit cost versus sales versus scheduled change is the same. I end up with getting the same answers if all I'm trading off are these things. Granted, the expenses aren't changing, and you know that's important in some of the cases. But if I'm trading off, you know, if I say, well, is it worth a month to delay of delay to reduce my cost by two percent? The answer is going to be no, whether my sales volumes were correct or overestimated by thirty percent. The answer to that question is still no. It's not worth it. Okay, another one of those kind of pretty valuable proofs. So it's we well while the total value is very much a function of uh, the actual numbers, the you know the baseline numbers. 
the trade-off, the, the, the outcome of the trade-off decisions is not that much of a function of actual volume. The volume terms falls out. Falls out. So, um, and again, if we're looking at ROI, then we want to be in the ballpark of correct. If we're, if we, when we're using ROI to make our decisions and build that threshold, we want to be in the ballpark of correct. Or we just say we're not sure we're in the ballpark of correct. Just bump up your threshold ROI. Only do the things that are going to pay you back 10 to 1 instead of 7 to 1 because we're not sure our numbers are correct. That's another way to kind of work through the uncertainties in here. And same sort of thing. If you're trading off expenses, um, if the expenses are small, if it's a few K here, a few K there, you know, it doesn't matter if your volumes are correct, you're not, your answers are going to come out the same. It's only if its expenses are pretty high that you kind of care whether or not your volume numbers are correct. Okay. Any other questions on that? That's, uh, that's the extent of my digging into the spreadsheet here. Um, any questions on the spreadsheet itself before we get out of the spreadsheet and get back to some of the nuances and implementing these things and Q&A session stuff? Yeah, Eric, there was one question, not, not exactly related to the spreadsheet, but I'll ask it now. Um, okay. They wanted to know, does the financial model include interest rate and time value of money calculations? Yeah, so this model it does not. Um, like I said, we, we could. Um, what we, the people we're hoping get good use out of this model are design leads, project managers, engineers who have to make the decision today whether or not to expedite that part, spend the 2K it's going to take to save two days or three days. You know, it's, it's those people who wouldn't understand necessarily an interest rate or buy into that being a good decision if those complexities are included in it. So um, it can. We don't necessarily recommend that you start there. Um, get, get the buy off on on a, on a more basic uh, analysis, and then you know that said, there most of these trade offs, again, the, the interest is going to fall out of that trade off. In most cases, the answer will be the same, even if you're not incorporating that complexity. Not all of them, a lot of them, and if you build you know your threshold ROIs. Uh, to accommodate that uncertainty, uh, then you, know, you can get a simpler model or faster decisions and less uh, kind of disagreements in terms of whether or not it's valid. Okay. Um, so, let me know if you have more questions on that. We can switch back to it if we need to. Uh, let me get the right presentation pulled back up again. Go back to slideshow mode, there we go, okay. So that's the spreadsheet, not rocket science, very simple calculations, um, and quite frankly that's the easy part. The hard part is, you know, get bringing other people up to speed on the logic, the understanding, the appreciation, the belief that it's valid. Um, it's essentially getting buy-in is hard to do. And ultimately, if we don't do that well, it does, it's not going to work out for us. So we listed here several of the many things that you want to do when you're trying to implement one of these things. There's a lot more I didn't, you know, couldn't fit on the one-page version of this. Um, I just kind of want to you know, make it known that uh, just because you know how to build one of these doesn't mean you're out of the woods and off and running and solving these problems. There's there's a lot you want to be careful of in terms of rolling it out well. Um, you know, we certainly know of some customers who tried to run with it and didn't get very far and ended up you know kind of leaving uh, some bad tastes in some people's mouth and now it's going to be even harder to try to implement the next time because uh, it didn't really go all that well the first time they ran into some pitfalls that you know, made it fail and basically it's going to make it harder to make it harder to make it succeed the next time. So um, just want to point that out that if you but if you do it right, you know tons of clarity, lots of great buy-in, you make faster decisions and 
more money. And ultimately, you get to meet all your other goals better too. So, with that, um, let's go ahead and get into the other Q and A questions. I'll go ahead and go back to the one about getting a number for volume impact. Um, I guess my recommendations there are if you can base it on real data, base it on real data. And for those who are familiar with uh, the Lean Startup, um, it presents some examples in the software development world of how you can put buttons out there that don't actually do anything, but you can measure who clicks on them and assess value based on real data from real customers. Um, if you can find one of those scenarios and do such a thing, that is absolutely positively the way to go. Um, another option, if you're familiar with the wisdom of crowds, um, you know, got a little time here, so I'm going to give you the short version of what the wisdom of crowds is in case you're not familiar. The wisdom of crowds is based on a book. Uh, looking at my shelf and it's too full. I can't find the guy's name now, but look it up. Um, the intro to the book is a story about a professor who went to the county fair back in the 1800s where they were raffling off a cow. And people had to guesstimate, estimate the post-butcher weight of this cow. So, and you know, if you estimated the post post you weight of the cow, right, you won the cow or the million dollars or you know, hundred dollars or something. But um, so all kinds of different people were putting in their estimates. Butchers, farmers, people who should know these things pretty well just by looking at the cow, as well as you know, schoolgirls and you know people that have no idea what the weight of that cow is. And lo and behold, he ran the numbers afterwards. He added up all those estimates. And while the closest, best, quote, unquote, expert, their guess was, I don't remember exactly the number, 50 pounds off, the average across all of the experts and all of the non-experts was within a few pounds of the right answer. And so the wisdom of crowds is basically take a, a bunch of disparate opinions, average the results, and use that, and it's really a pretty good estimate. Um, this behavior, this, uh, you know, the, the possibility to do this is in action in many places. It's basically how the Vegas betting lines go, and there's no better predictor for the outcome of a game than what the Vegas betting line says, because there's wisdom of the crowds at work on that game, on that line. And so you can use the same sort of thing for sales volume. Um, if you have 20, 30 people you shout out these ask these questions to and they can give you a guess and you average those in lieu of any real numbers, that might be the best you're gonna get. That might be a pretty good number, you know, better than what you can get just with one or two so quote unquote experts guessing at it. Um, beyond those two results, you know, other than you know, I don't really have much more to offer on that. Um, well, yeah. So, and there's sorry. There's there's a third option there. Um, the third option is to take your experts' guesses or your wisdom of crowds' guesses or a smaller subset, capture them, and then where you can measure the actual of those, and then later when you have more guesses to do later, you temper those, you scale it up, scale it down based on what the actual has been on guesses that you've made in the past. That can be somewhat helpful to get some buy-in and get better numbers. Um, but it's, it's really surprising how wrong we as experts are in general. And you know, kind of getting a cross-section is going to get you a better number than asking one person what they think. So, and I'm, you know, I'm including myself in that as well. So, uh, what else we got? Any other questions? Yeah, we have two. Um, one person said, "The who should the process owner be?" The slide before this one hmm. said, "Have a process owner own this." That who should Good that question. Be? Good question. Um, the best ideal one is somebody in finance. Somebody in finance who says, "We believe in these numbers, and we would like you to use them to base your decisions on that." Um, or someone in a position to say. These are good numbers. Um, 
if it's if that's not necessarily the person ultimately that's going to own it and keep it up to date. Oftentimes, you know, the person owning it and keeping it up to date is the product manager, sometimes the project manager, program manager. You know, different titles mean different things in different places a lot of times. But um, you know, somebody in a position of authority who, as a critical piece of that, gets buy-in by the guy in finance who's in a position of authority on calculating numbers. Okay, and the last one said, um, how long does this take to develop the first time? Um, so that's a good question. It uh, depends on how complex your situation is. Um, you know, if I were to start this from scratch on a simple model, I don't know. I guess it's hard to estimate. I've been through it too many times. And it depends on how, how good you are at Excel and how, um, how complex your model is. Certainly, uh, the forecasts that you enter into the model probably already exist somewhere. It's not usually difficult to get the forecast, at least the annual forecasts. Getting the monthly forecast to input into that, you know, sometimes there's some work involved in getting somebody to give you some monthly forecasts. But um, building a basic model should take you a day, and you know we can certainly save you that day. Um, and if you want to try, you know, if you want to talk to us about you know, getting the right template for what you got going on. Um, certainly the more complex models where you've got you know, five different products, you've got your, for example, a phone system where you've got a handpiece and an extension set and a base unit set, you know, you have a bunch of different parts to what your product is and then all of those have different contents, you know, involving those complexities, if you've got um, cannibalization and things like that, I mean, that adds a little bit of time to what you have going on. When I read the question, Eric, I was wondering if it, uh, if they meant getting all the buy-in. Like you said, you mm. create a spreadsheet in a day, but I was thinking getting all the stakeholders and all the numbers. I see. Uh, that, that was, I don't know, my okay. guess. Okay. There, there's a large variance in, the, in that one, too. Um, the more progressive companies and certainly the smaller companies, the startup startups of the world, and they're a lot easier and faster with the buy-in. The larger, more bureaucratic, older companies are a lot slower with the buy-in. So it's anywhere from a week to months by the time you kind of get it, even even maybe a foothold and, and able to really kind of use it uh, for much more than just kind of backroom discussions. Okay. And that was the last question we have at this time. So, all right. So, um, you know, if you want interested in learning more, you have any more follow-on questions? If you want to develop your own model with our help or using one of our templates, you know, we're certainly happy to help. Just tell us in the chat window. Send me an email. Give me a call. We'll get you set up with the model of your product or model of you, that you need, free of charge. We're not, uh, you know, we just want to help you understand what the cost of delay is and help you alleviate your pain. Honestly, um, I'll like, you know, like to talk to you in the process. So, um, but we do have, before we go, we do have a poll uh, we'd like to throw up if there are no more questions. We'll uh, just go with that. Thanks, everybody, and I uh, hope to see you on the next webinar. And we're asking here what you think that next webinar ought to contain. <laughs>